it's been called the Facebook revolution, and we all know that Mark Zuckerberg is responsible for everything. But it, it wouldn't have happened unless those protesters went to the streets of a city. It wouldn't have happened if they just decided to block Mubarak from their, from their Facebook pages. It actually had to have people on the ground coming together, as people have come together in cities for thousands of years, forcing political change by direct action in cities. It's an example of something that's happening throughout the world, which is that new technologies, globalization, the ability to effortlessly telecommunicate across the world is making cities more, not less important. In a sense, that's something of a surprise. After all, you'd normally think that the ability to connect over vast distances electronically would make it absolutely unnecessary for us to possibly get close to one another. But that's not at all what's happening. If you go back 35 years ago to the, to the days of my childhood in, in New York City, it looked as if not just President Ford, but history itself was telling New York and all of America's older cities to drop dead. It looked as if these places had been passed over into the trash heap of history. After all, their great industries, garment production in New York, automobile production in Detroit, had been made largely irrelevant by the ability to make garments in cheaper, far-flung places throughout the world. Manufacturing jobs fled, and it looked as if these places had completely lost their race on death. In some places, people also left from colder places to warmer places because of this decline in transportation costs. Americans followed the sun, and no variable better predicts urban growth in the 20th century than January temperatures. Moreover, many older cities had done an incredibly foolish thing in response to this decline, which is that they had built more infrastructure. They decided that what a city needed, despite the fact that it had an abundance of cheap housing and lots of empty roads, was more physical stuff. This is Detroit's people mover, a monorail that glides over essentially empty streets. What utter nonsense is this? The last thing a place that has an abundance of structures relative to people needs, people needs is more structures. But today, cities are back. This shows the relationship between metropolitan area size and output per worker. If all of America became as productive as, New York, as the New York City area, national GDP would rise by 43%. The rise of cities is even more evident in the developing world, where we've just recently passed the mark where more than 50% of the world lives in cities. And that's a good thing, too, as in average in cities and countries where urbanization is over 50%, GDP per worker is four times as large as in those countries where GDP is less than 50%. That doesn't make the, mean that cities naturally make you wealthier, but it does mean that cities are part of the development process. Now, if new infrastructure does, didn't create turnarounds in places like Detroit, what did? How did New York come back? How did Boston come back? The basic process, the basic resolution to the paradox of why the death of distance has made proximity more valuable is what globalization and new ideas have been, and uh, new technologies have done is they've increased the returns to being smart. They've made it more valuable to have a new idea because you can sell that idea on the other side of the planet because you can figure out ways to supply your, your new idea with things across the globe. And cities work by channeling the most basic and important human talents, the ability to learn from people around you. We come out of the womb with a remarkable ability to learn from our parents, from everyone around us. We have senses, we have talents, which enable us to learn from people who are close to one another. Now, it's true that we can certainly learn things by, by computer, but the most intense things, the most important things, are communicated face to face. These new technologies are killing cities for the same reason that they're not killing Harvard. Right? This is what we do every day in this university. We exchange ideas and knowledge by being close to one another, by channeling this basic human ability to learn from being, being next to each other. In part, it's because this closeness enables us to communicate, to figure out the most difficult thing in teaching is figuring out not your subject, but what the people you're listening to, or you're talking to, are actually hearing. Being face-to-face -face makes that happen. Cities also transmit knowledge through happenstance occurrences through the insights that a young worker on Wall Street or in Silicon Valley is going to get by seeing smart people around him succeed, or seeing dumb people around her fail. Either way, you're learning something, whether or not it's, it's good or bad. What you're looking at here is, of course, the city writ small. It's Michael Bloomberg's bullpen. He got this idea from the trading floor at Solomon Brothers that he, that he used to run. And one of the interesting things about trading floors or, or bullpens is that these are some of the richest people in the world who can afford some of the largest offices. But what they choose is proximity. They choose instead of like 
faculty members to lock themselves behind doors where they can be alone. They choose to be right on top of each other, where they can learn as much as they, they possibly can. And that learning is what makes them productive. Bloomberg itself is, of course, an example of what cities do at their best, which is taking ideas from one industry and using them into another. He's an IT entrepreneur, but he came out of finance. And he was able to succeed as an IT entrepreneur because he knew things that no software engineer in Silicon Valley knew. He knew what the people at Merrill wanted. He knew what his customers for his terminals wanted. The importance of ideas in city growth shows up statistically. It shows up in the fact that the one variable that predicts which older, colder cities manage to come back is skills. What you're looking at across the x-axis and the share of the population with a college degree in 1970. What you're looking at across the y-axis is how fast population growth has been. This is the in relationship between income and skills across metropolitan areas. As the share of the population in your metropolitan area with a college degree increases by 10%, your wages go up by 8%, holding your skills constant. This is because we are social species and we get smart by hanging out with other smart people. That's fundamentally how cities work. Small firms are also part of, part of urban sixth sense. Now, the result of urban turnarounds, the result of the urban cities' tremendous power, is that they actually also attract large numbers of poor people. It's often thought that urban poverty is a sign that cities are failing, but it's not. Urban poverty is actually a sign of, of urban success because cities don't make people poor, they attract poor people. They attract poor people with economic opportunity, and the prospect of, of Create of getting around without a car for every adult. Some of my work that's discussed in this book of mine shows that actually when you build a subway stop in an area, that area gets poorer. That doesn't mean that the subway stop isn't making people poorer in any way. It means that it's actually providing the ability to get around with it without a car. Of course, cities, urban poverty creates enormous challenges. These challenges require huge investments like the Croton Aqueduct, which actually you know, brought clean water to New York and helped New York change from a place where 110 years ago, a child born in New York City could expect to live seven years less than a child born elsewhere in the nation. Today, life expectancy is longer in New York. Among young people, that's fueled by lower suicide rates in New York and much lower rates of motor vehicle accidents. This is the decline in, in uh, pestilence in New York. The same, these downsides of density also show up in terms of congestion and crime. And while water required an engineering solution, congestion doesn't seem to be fixable by roads. It requires pricing, which is what you see in Singapore. Because if you just build more roads, people drive more. It's called the fundamental law of traffic congestion. <laughs> Cities also, when they succeed, require more space. You don't build space in declining places where you already have plenty of structures. But when a place is, is growing, when a place is succeeding, if you don't build structures, the place becomes an unaffordable city that's uninclusive and can't provide affordable space for people. This is Jane Jacobs, the great urbanist, looking quite cat-faced about the high-rise towers that were around her. She envisioned one particular form of low-rise low -rise living, and that form is great. But cities also need to have the freedom to move on, to provide space for people to come. And too often when we enact an excess of preservationist laws in cities or other forms of land use controls, we privilege the past at the expense of the future. We make places like Boston unaffordable to people who want and need to come there. This problem is even more severe in the developing world. Let me end with a, with a story about another advantage of living in cities. This is a story about a young Harvard graduate, who have already heard him mentioned here today, who went for a walk, went for a picnic, went, for, went to do some fishing in the woods outside of Concord in 1844. The fishing was good, there hadn't been much rain lately, and as a result, he caught a lot of fish. And he, he took the fish, and with his friend, they made a chowder. The wind flicked the flames in the nearby tall grass, which was fairly dry, and a fire started. A great, the great conflagration uh, spread, and soon there was an inferno which had taken down 300 acres or more of prime conquered woodland. This person, of course, was castigated during his era as a great enemy of the environment, quite understandably. He was called a flippity by the by the conquered freeman, which is, which is, of course, damning words indeed. Of course, this man is now the secular saint of modern environmentalism, Henry David Thoreau. And of course, the point about Thoreau is that no Bostonian that I know of in the same time period did as much damage to the environment as he did. <laughs> that in fact, his life illustrates a central point about the environment. We are a destructive species, and if you love nature, stay away from it. <laughs> and that's really the point about cities, that in fact cities are far greener than suburban or rural areas. This is a map of my estimates of carbon emissions by location within Greater Boston. And carbon emissions are far lower in dense urban areas for two reasons. This is holding income and family size constant, both because people in cities drive much less and because people in cities inhabit smaller spaces, which are consequently associated with less electricity. 
and, um, and, and less home heating use as well. So uh, cities are, are not just more productive, they're not just more fun, they're not just more uh, dynamic, they're actually also greener, regardless of what the greenery may actually show us. Thank you very much.